the best preserved Roman temple, the most impressive product of Roman engineering, arguably the most influential building of all time. As a monument and as a relic of antiquity, the Pantheon stands alone. Unlike so many great buildings, the Pantheon is easily accessible. The doors are almost always open, and tourists stream steadily over the marble floor, gaping at the famous dome. Most visitors stay only a few minutes, and even those who come armed with guidebooks and the best of intentions often leave the building with only a vague idea of the Pantheon's history and significance. This video uses some of the Pantheon's often overlooked details to explore that history and significance, and to explain why this most famous of Roman buildings lives up to its reputation. As usual, I'm Dr. Garrett Ryan, and I hope you'll enjoy this brief journey into the hidden history of Rome's Pantheon. I like to approach the Pantheon from the west, where a narrow street broadens, almost without warning, into a piazza, and the temple looms abruptly overhead. Before taking the obligatory pictures of the façade, I often circle the curving outer wall. Although this rugged cliff of masonry is not as photogenic as the façade, it's every bit as impressive. For here, and only here, the bones of the Pantheon are visible. The Pantheon is the supreme triumph of Roman concrete. Roman concrete consisted of the volcanic ash known as Pazzolana, mixed with water and lime. It was not poured like its modern counterpart, but laid like mortar in thin courses. First, retaining walls of brick or stone were built as a sort of form. A layer of coarse aggregate, usually chunks of limestone or broken tile, was laid down, and the blend of pazzolana and lime was troweled over it, almost dry. The mixture was then pounded firm with wooden mallets. The concrete foundations and walls of the Pantheon were likely constructed by several contractors working in unison. Each contractor employed a small team of masons who built the brick facings. The blend of rubble and concrete that made up the bulk of the wall was then laid by teams of unskilled laborers. It seems to have been typical to finish about 4 feet, or 1.2 meters, a day. The hard part especially in buildings with very thick walls, was ensuring that the concrete dried and settled evenly. To ensure that it would, the architect of the Pantheon incorporated an elaborate series of chambers and recesses into the walls, which introduced air into the masses of concrete and reduced the structure's overall weight. The voids in the Pantheon's walls were spanned by relieving arches of brick, which evened settlement of the concrete core, and directed weight toward the rotunda's strongest points. Although the blind arches visible in the Pantheon's brickwork seem to be structurally distinct from the relieving arches and the concrete behind them, they fill the same basic function, strengthening the mass of masonry and preventing the development of critical stresses. And now, having stared at walls long enough, we come around to the front of the Pantheon. As we see it now, the Pantheon looks like what it is, a relic from a vanished world. It is ringed by buildings nearly 2,000 years younger than itself, and stands almost two stories below the surrounding streets. To understand its intended visual impact, we have to imagine how it appeared in antiquity. Or, instead of imagining, we can just look at this nifty reconstruction drawing. Originally, the Pantheon stood at one end of a long court. It was elevated above the surrounding plaza, not sunk below it, and the dome, now so prominent, was visible only as a flickering glint of gold above the porch. It's much more obvious now than it was in antiquity that the Pantheon consists of two very different parts, the portico and the concrete rotunda behind it. The portico looked like the vast majority of Greek and Roman temples. The rotunda was almost unique, a typically Roman fusion of innovation and conservatism. Since the Renaissance, visitors have noticed that the Pantheon's portico and rotunda are awkwardly joined. The portico seems too short for the huge building behind it, and in fact, to judge from a second pediment outlined on the block that connects it to the rotunda, the portico was meant to be ten feet higher. 
This has led scholars to conclude that the Pantheon was supposed to have taller columns. It may have failed to receive them because the columns were lost in transit or diverted to another construction project. But it's also possible that the sheer weight of larger columns would have been problematic on the marshy ground beneath the Pantheon. The columns the Pantheon did receive are 40 Roman feet tall, the equivalent of about 39 standard feet, or 12 meters, and weigh about 50 tons each. Although their Corinthian capitals are marble, the columns are Egyptian granite. Unlike the Greeks, the Romans liked monolithic columns, columns carved, that is, from a single piece of stone. Monolithic columns made of marble tend to crack along natural fault lines. But granite, an igneous rock, has no natural faults and can thus be used safely. All the columns on the outside of the portico are gray granite, except for the three on the left, or east side. These three were imported from other Roman buildings and installed in the 17th century to replace columns damaged during the Middle Ages. The inscription on the Pantheon's facade reads, Marcus Agrippa, son of Lucius, consul for the third time, built this. Agrippa, however, had nothing to do with the temple you see. He was responsible for the original Pantheon, which was destroyed by fire and replaced by the current building early in the reign of Hadrian. Hadrian left Agrippa's name on the facade as a gesture of humility. The later emperors Septimius Severus and Caracalla, however, had no qualms about associating their own names with a very minor restoration. You can just barely see the two-line inscription they left, just above the column capitals. The triangular pediment of the Pantheon is just a wall of battered travertine now, but during the Roman era, it sported a colossal bronze eagle. Until the 17th century, the Pantheon's portico featured a ceiling of gilded bronze, suspended from a unique system of tubular bronze girders. But in 1626, Pope Urban VIII tore the ceiling and girders down. The bronze, which weighed over 450,000 pounds, was melted down and cast into 110 cannons for the papal arsenal. The wooden rafters and roof we see today are 17th century replacements. On either side of the Pantheon's door are huge alcoves, which likely held colossal statues of Augustus and Agrippa. Like much of the Pantheon's exterior, they were initially veneered with marble, which was stripped away and burned for lime sometime in the Middle Ages. These days, the Pantheon's glories are all inside the rotunda. And so, trembling with anticipation, we approach the door. The bronze door we see today may not be original, since the marble door frame, 40 Roman feet tall, was apparently designed for a much larger gate. But even if the door we have is not original, it is ancient, one of the very few Roman doors still in service today. So let's take a deep breath and step into the greatest triumph of Roman architecture. As we enter, let's do what everyone does and look up. The rotunda of the Pantheon is both awesomely spacious and impressively symmetrical. It has a diameter of 150 Roman feet, that is, 142 standard feet, or 43 meters, uninterrupted by any column or buttress. The crown of the dome is exactly 150 Roman feet above the floor. As the illustration shows, a sphere 150 Roman feet in diameter would fit perfectly inside, just touching the walls, floor, and dome. Since the initial impression of the rotunda is so overwhelming, it might be useful to single out a few of the details that make it so special. Let's start with the floor. Though repaired over the centuries, the Pantheon's floor is original. It contains a dazzling array of imported marble, granite, and porphyry whose differing colors and textures draw the eye along a checkerboard pattern of circles and squares. 
The walls of the rotunda, nearly twenty feet, or six meters, thick, are interrupted by seven large alcoves, framed with columns of colored marble. Between the alcoves are marble shrines built into the walls. Both alcoves and shrines were designed to frame statues of gods and emperors. They now house a series of chapels and devotional images. Ever since the Byzantine emperor Phocas gave it to Pope Boniface IV in the early 7th century, the Pantheon has been a church, consecrated to Mary and the Martyrs. According to one medieval legend, in fact, no fewer than 28 cartloads of martyrs' bones were brought here from the catacombs and placed beneath the altars. Although the Pantheon remains a church, the fame of its relics has long since been eclipsed by the fame of its architecture. Since the Renaissance, the building has been revered as both a miraculous survival from antiquity and as a symbol of the city of Rome. These associations made the Pantheon the final resting place of several Renaissance artists, including Raphael, and of the first two kings of unified Italy. Now at last we look up from the alcoves and dead artists and admire the famous dome, wider even than the dome of St. Peter's Basilica. Like the walls, the dome was built from layers of concrete, molded and hammered over a huge wooden form. To prevent the weight of the dome from pushing the walls outward, the architect of the Pantheon made the dome heaviest and thickest around its edges. The upper parts of the dome, on the other hand, were made as thin and light as possible, partly by mixing feather-light volcanic scoria from the slopes of Vesuvius into the concrete. The appearance of the dome was also carefully considered. The five rows of recessed coffers have the practical function of reducing the dome's weight, but they are also integral to the visual impact of the building, creating a constantly shifting visual drama as they catch and hold the light spilling in through the oculus. The effect would have been even more pronounced in antiquity when the coffers were studded with golden rosettes. Besides the door, the oculus, or skylight, in the center of the dome was the Pantheon's only source of light. The oculus is 30 Roman feet, almost 9 meters across. Like the coffers, it had the function of reducing the dome's weight. But, again like the coffers, it's part of the decoration, the brilliant focal point of the whole interior. The oculus has never been glazed, and rain pours freely through it. The water, caught by drains in the floor, flows to the Tiber through the original Roman sewer. If you look closely at the oculus, you can see an elaborate metal molding around the rim. This is the only surviving component of the Pantheon's original gilded bronze roof. The rest of the bronze was stripped away for scrap in the early Middle Ages and replaced with the lead sheeting that still covers the dome. Today, as mentioned, the Pantheon is a symbol and icon of ancient and modern Rome. But what purpose did it serve when it was first built? The name Pantheon suggests a temple to all the gods. But it seems clear that the building was primarily designed for veneration of the Roman emperors, in a setting that may have been intended to evoke the shape of the universe itself. Before we leave the Pantheon, let's pause by the door and imagine what the building was like in antiquity. Gods and emperors gaze out from the alcoves and shrines. The sharp aroma of incense hangs in the air. Sunlight streams through the oculus. And overhead, the rosettes in the dome sparkle like stars. I hope you enjoyed this short tour of the Pantheon. I hope to do other hidden histories of famous ancient monuments in the near future, so stay tuned. If you have any suggestions for buildings you would like to see explored on this channel, please let me know in the comments. For more on Roman concrete and Roman construction, check out my forthcoming book, Naked Statues, Fat Gladiators, and War Elephants, Frequently Asked Questions About the Ancient Greeks and Romans. You can find many more videos about the classical world on my website, tollandstone.com. In the meantime, as always, thanks for watching.